first cracked I was like ACL oh. basically they cancelled my op so I ended up waiting four months um, because obviously we went into a global pandemic and then my dad was like don't go easy on her just because she's a girl she needs to learn <laughs> what was the journey like for you because like a lot of players say they didn't see a professional career at the end of it they just play the game for the love of it so what, what was you doing in the meantime before the professional contract came about well I was in college so I remember my first year I think I had the FA Cup final on a Sunday in college on a Monday oh my god you know like when you're at school and you've got a friend in another class, but then when you link up, it's like, oh, we're here. So like, St. Yeah. George's Park must have been sick having like, being able to be there at the same time. Well, yeah, he's a little, he's cheeky, isn't he? So I was like, I can't get in trouble when I'm going to camp. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Pippa Monique podcast, a podcast that brings you conversations with influential people and players from both the men's and women's game. Today, I'm joined by Everton defender Gabriella George, or do you like being called Gabs George? Gabby. Gabby. Yeah. Gabby. Started out playing in their dad's, dad's team with full grown adults, by the way. Uh, joined the Manchester United Centre of Excellence, aged 14. She became Everton's first ever full time footballer in 2017 and had a full international debut in a 6 0 World Cup qualifying win over Kazakhstan. I mean, it's great to have you on and just talk about you, your future, how football's been for you, and just, just get to know a bit more about you. And I feel like it's perfect time, really, because you've been back on the team sheet recently after almost being out a whole year with an ACL injury. So how does it feel? Right, to join you. Um, it's It's been a whirlwind of the last 12 months, to say the least. Um, but I was finally back on the team sheet yesterday. Um, and obviously, hopefully, onwards and upwards from here. Yeah. Does it feel like, do you get this like mad nervous sensation, even though you've been playing football for years? But getting back into it, you've got new players in the squad now as well. Like, how has it been integrating back into the team as well as meeting, like, the new players? Yeah, I said on one of my first, like, proper training sessions back, it makes you feel like you're a bit drunk. Like, everything <laughs> that's going on around you, like, because you haven't been involved for, like, 12 months. Yeah. To get the basic things and, like, everything was just echoing. And I was like, it just felt surreal. Like, it's something that I've never done before. But I know that moment. I found my, my footing quite quickly. <laughs> Does it feel like one of the, because I get that moment when I ever did like a first, let's say just standing up having to speak in front of people for the first time, you get like this whirlwind moment and everything you can't really hear, your throat goes dry. Was it one of those feelings? Yeah, literally. I was like, they put me in for like 11 v 11 and I was just looking around like. Straight away? Okay. No, I did like a few sessions, but my first oh. 11 v 11, I was just literally like, this is bizarre. How has it been? Like, let's touch back on, I know it's, this is probably like the negative part, but let's touch back on when it happened. It's almost been a year now since the injury. I mean, it was a it was a good day for the, the club because a 5 0 win over Bristol City, wasn't it? Yeah. You came off first five minutes. Um, did you know it was an ACL injury at the time? Uh no. Um, I've never really had many serious injuries before. So at first the pain was in my knee, but then it went like round the side a bit. So I was like, oh, it's not ACL. When it first cracked, I was like ACL. Oh, and yeah. then I thought, oh, no, it won't be. Um, I'll be fine. And then I was on the way back from the Bristol game. I had crutches and stuff, and I was, like, trying to move my knee, and I was like, oh, I'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> we had United, I think, the weekend after. On the weekend, so that game was the Monday. We had United on the Sunday, and I was like, yeah, I'll be fine for that. I'll just have a few days off. <laughs> so once the adrenaline wore off, did the pain, like, really kick in then? Yeah, it just... I can't really explain the feeling. It just felt stiff, like really. Yeah. Stiff. Um, and I have quite a high pain threshold, so I play through quite a lot. Sounds like it. So, um, yeah, I just, I just didn't think it was anything bad. I thought maybe a, a month or so. Yeah. What's, the, what's like the process after an injury like that when you find out it is a serious injury, especially during a year that's been different for everyone else. The whole lockdown happened shortly after that. How did the club and yourself like handle such a such a big injury? Like, what was the process? Yeah, well, it was kind of new to everyone because obviously I was waiting a month for my surgery from when I did it, um, just to let the swelling go down and everything settle down and build a bit of strength back up. Um, and it got to the day before my surgery, and I see my physio ringing my phone, and I was like, I was sat in bed and I was like, oh, I'm not going to answer it. And then what? I answered it, and she was like, um. Basically, they cancelled my op, 
So I ended up waiting four months um, because obviously we went into a global pandemic and I think the last thing that was the problem was obviously my surgery, which I understood at the time it was difficult to take, but we, we was going through something we've never been through before as a country and a nation. So uh, that part was probably the most difficult part because I didn't then have a next date of when the surgery was going to be. Um, it was just waiting for COVID to settle down. Um, and because we didn't know what COVID was, we didn't know when it was going to be. Um, so the club were great. They got me lots of equipment. They got me a walk bike. Um, and then I went into the surgery probably in the best shape I've been in, in years. So it didn't work out too bad. I think waiting the four months is probably the best thing that I did in terms of the recovery on the other side because we'll touch wood, but it's been quite smooth running so far and um, the club have supported me in every way that they can. It's good that it worked out timing-wise because as you were saying that, when you said four months, I'm thinking how on earth do you keep in shape not knowing whether you can like train or put weight on your leg or not and then most people sat at home a lot of us have started with well, me personally started eating a lot more during lockdown you become a little bit more relaxed and, and a lot of things weigh on your mind trying to figure out what's the next move what's the next plan especially for you did not feel like a major setback not knowing not only for you not knowing when you'll be able to get your operation but women's football as a whole was just put on a standstill yeah well yeah it was to be to be honest, it wasn't as hard as it could have been. I mean, like mentally, I'm quite strong anyway. So there was days when it was horrible and I felt like the world was against me. But then there was days where I was fine. But because there was no football going on, I wasn't watching football. So it wasn't difficult for me. Um, obviously, if the girls were carrying on playing and I was still waiting and nothing was happening, I think it would have been a lot harder. But because football was on a pause, so the last thing in the back of my mind was football, I was just concentrating on myself and obviously trying to forget about football for a little bit and having that time out. Yeah. I mean, t talking of ACLs, it's been such a big thing in women's football in particular. Your, your injury happened February 2020. No, 2019, was it? 2020. Yeah. 20, yeah. 20, I'm messing, I don't know what year it is anymore. And I think it was 2018, 2019, there was a lot of ACL injuries in the women's game in the lead up to the World Cup, Arsenal's Jordan Nobbs. There was Bristol City's Abby Harrison. And there was, I think, about 12 Manchester City's um, defender, Mannion. Yeah. There was a lot of ACL injuries, I think 12 over the 23 clubs in the top two tiers. What there's been, there was a lot of research going into it, especially by the FA launching. Um, research to do with the menstrual cycle and I think Bristol City were the first club to to incorporate that in training and in everything they were learning did that did that play a part of your progress in get, getting better did they did they talk to you the club or anyone about all this research about menstrual cycles and stuff like that um we talked we read a lot into ACLs and just in general really um, a lot of people said it was due to like alignments of women's hips because obviously we grow different to men um yeah. There's a lot of studies that are out there, but to be honest, I didn't really read many of them. I was just reading about um, the graft I was getting taken, how long recovery is, yeah, yeah. who's done it. Um, I spoke to quite a lot of people that have were going through the same. I spoke to Aoife quite a lot. Um, Abby Harrison messaged me, so they were all messaging, and I knew, obviously, I've seen Jordan. She came back, and she's in fine form, so I was like... it. it it's just something that happens in the game. Um, obviously, when you first do it, the first thing that was going through my mind was, I'm not going to come back the same. Yeah. Now I feel better than I felt before. I've been in training, I feel sharp. So I'm like, I don't, I don't have that fear. I think it's just getting over the first two weeks and then just smashing your rehab, really. I mean, like, I enjoyed my rehab because there's no point in going in every day and sobbing about it. And that's yeah. Yeah. And that's what I realised quite soon on that me being sad about it is not going to fix nothing, but me smashing my rehab will fix it all. And I think I've done really well in my rehab. I've kept strong mentally. I've gone in every day smiling and, and it's been great being around the girls. They've been great with me. So I just feel like it's it's a mental thing rather than a yeah. physical thing. Definitely. That's the best way to look at it, to be honest with you. I mean, just touching on one more question on that. I watched in the men's game, Hector Bellerin had a big in ACL injury as well. And he did a documentary on it that he released on YouTube. And he just kept replaying the, the, the day in his head. So like the, the day of the game that it happened, he kept thinking, was it something that I ate? Did I do something wrong that morning? Did you did you look back on the day and start questioning all these different things about, is it because I woke up too early, too late? Just the smallest things. 
Yeah, well, to be honest, I did a look back at the day because uh, basically during that week leading up, I kept getting like niggles in my knee, but I never really have anything. So when I was decelerating, like I could feel something in my knee, but I just left it because I just thought, oh, it'll be fine. And then in that warm up, I was decelerating and I was like, that's not right. I was like, right, I'll play the game and then I'll speak to the physio after. I have to never come because I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> you don't want to pick up the phone. <laughs> um, so yeah, I did. I did replay the day over and over again, and I think it's only ever a learning curve because I, I was a person that wanted to play every minute, no matter what. Like I'd played with, I'd never tell the physios anything because I'd want to play and I wouldn't want them not to let me play. So yeah, I have a Players always do that. I see it. I see it a lot in the Premier League because we see it a lot on TV. Some it doesn't really happen much in WSL that I've noticed, but especially in the Premier League, you'll see players clearly struggling, and they'll tell the, the coach or the manager, "I'm fine. Yeah, let me carry on." And and the fans will be at home thinking, "You're not fine though. Yeah, like, what are you doing? You just want to play. It's the competitiveness. You just want to play, right? Yeah, but, it's it's a massive learning curve for myself, but I don't think I'll do it again. <laughs> well, at least you're back. Hopefully, we'll see you back in action as well. Let's throw it back and talk about. Because what I've learned is that your first time playing in the team, apparently, correct me if I'm wrong, was your dad's team? Well, not like I wasn't official, but I used to train with my dad's team quite a lot. Okay. Um, because my dad loved football. I loved football. So when he used to have training on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I used to just go down and just train with them. Um, was, was it like a situation where you would tag along, basically, and then end up just joining in? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then my dad was like, don't go easy on her just because she's a girl. She needs to learn. <laughs> Love that, though. Because I was thinking, what was like the reaction of... Because it's just, it's just a men's team, full-grown men, right? Yeah, but I'm quite aggressive anyway. So <laughs> I'd end up kicking one of them wrong and then they'd want to get me back. <laughs> at, what, this is at 12 years old, though. Yeah, I've done it from... I think I've done it from, like, nine. What? And the older I got, the more harder it got because they started hitting me a bit harder. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think that's helped you now in your, like, your profes professional career? Yeah, um, I think a lot of girls played in boys teams growing up I never played in a boys team I only have trained with my dad's team and only have played in girls team but like mm. physically I think like that's one of my strengths so I think I probably did get that quite young you mentioned that you played in the girls team I don't like you said I rarely hear that what age were you at when you was this the, the center of excellence or was it before this before the Centre of Excellence, um, I was playing for Fletcher Moss. Um, I think I was eight, nine, um, and I was playing oh, awesome. under 12s. And then from Fletcher Moss, I went to Blackpool, which was also the girls' team. And then on to United Centre. Oh, well, I was at Denton Town for a good three, four years. So that yeah. was the girls' team as well. So it was like Fletcher Moss, Denton, Blackpool, United. Like these I'm not the best at geography right but these sound like places that are not close to each other at all so at this young age how are you managing to be at all these different clubs and then end up at Manchester United Centre of Excellence how does that happen so basically we never knew about like girls centre of excellence um and then I wanted I really wanted to play for a football team so I was like asking my dad find me a football team and he was like I can't find any girls teams and then he found this one which was Fletcher Moss yeah um but they was under 12s and I was like eight but you're not allowed to play three years up. Mm. So we twisted the rules a little bit so I could play. Um, was <laughs> and I was playing there and then someone on an opposition team found out my age and went to the FA and I got banned from playing there. So the Fletcher uh. Moss put me on to Denton. But Why Denton, did you do that for? What a hater. Because you were too good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I used to score lots of goals before I'd become a defender. Where was you playing before? Yeah, I was a, I was a winger or a striker until I was sixteen. Okay. Um, and then yeah, they put me on to Denton where I stayed for a while, and then we thought I went. We played for a tournament for Denton because that's not that far from mine. Um, and I played in a tournament and Blackpool scouted me, so we was like, let's just go down, <laughs> down for a year. And then we realised how many centre of excellence it was because we was playing against United. Yeah. Um, and then there was like Burnley, um, and we was like, oh, maybe we can go closer to home. <laughs> so when you say you let's just go down to Blackpool, did you move there for a year, or did you just travel? I was going to say what, <laughs> or did you just no. travel up there regularly? No, my mum and dad used to take me. 
Um, amazing. Well, they used to take turns because we used to train twice a week then a game on the weekend. So they'd both come to the game and take turns. Um, but my mum and dad have took me everywhere. I think when I was at United Centre of Excellence, my dad, my mum was working night shifts. So yeah. she'd come and take me training, sleep in the car, then take oh. me to work. All of these sacrifices, that's crazy. Yeah. Because how far, like, you, you grew up in Cornwall, right? No. <laughs> I'm oh well, <laughs> you grew up in Manchester. <laughs> oh, this is why you should. This my research is wrong because I was thinking, wait, she grew up in Cornwall and ended up at Manchester United Centre. Oh, like, how? <laughs> Someone can change that on Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like though, playing at Manchester United Centre Excellence? Because there wasn't, like you said, there wasn't many academies for females. And every time I talk to a female footballer, they always mention, you know, I think back then it was either Fulham that always had one, like London teams. And Arsenal, of course. So what was it like being part of the Manchester United one? Yeah, well, I was a United fan at the time. I was only 14, so I was I was buzzing. Um, the training was something that I'd never experienced before in terms of like tactical, technical, everything that you don't get when you're just at like, grassroots. Um, mm. So, yeah, it was um, a great first professional environment, if that's what you'd call it at that age. Um, that to step into and like who when you step into an in, environment like that you kind of feel like me personally I'd feel like I've low-key made it here like this is like the big step into like being a professional footballer at that age are you seeing professional football as a career or are you just doing it because you love it I was just doing it because I loved it um at the time I didn't watch much women's football if I'm honest uh, I used mm. to watch um, men's football constantly with my dad um but I never really knew much about the women's game until I did go to United Centre of Excellence and that opened up a whole whole new world to me. Um, yeah. And then that's when I wanted it more as a career than just a hobby. But as a striker, not a defender. <laughs> <laughs> as, a, as a striker, I was going to ask, was there anyone in the women's game that inspired you to be a striker? But I'm, ge I'm guessing at the time not, now that you said that. So who, who in the men's game was you like looking up to? To be honest, like I did, I, I loved United growing up. So I did used to like that Rio Ferdinand, Vidic. Like I loved them. Um, mm. But I just, I liked Ronaldo. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, legend, isn't it? I thought it was Ronaldo, but I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> everyone, every my son thinks he's Ronaldo. Like, oh, my mum and dad used to call me growing up Ronaldinho because I used to have like, I used to have my hair, hair oh, yeah. and, um, a little plait. <laughs> And then my head was dead bombed as well. Like, who used to call me Ronaldinho? So. I'll take that. I'll take that any day. Call me Ronaldinho. <laughs> <now. laughs> so if when you look at the women's game now, um, it's a lot more, it's a lot more in your face. Like from our generation, your generation as well, you, like you said, there's not many female footballers that you can look up to. And, and whoever was following women's football at the time, it was always pretty much the same names, uh, like the Kelly Smith, the Rachel Yankees, a lot of the time Arsenal, because they were at the forefront at the time. Now, who would you say, not just in English football, in women's football overall, is just is just steering it in the right direction? Or someone that you look up to and think, wow, I'm so glad I play in the same league as this person or get to see or play against them? Yeah, I feel like uh, there's quite a lot in the women's game now. Um, as you said, it's it's in your face and it's impossible not to know <laughs> people yeah. in the women's game now. Um, I think, to be honest, when I first came through, um, I learned a lot about Lindsay Johnson, who used to play next to me. I was just going to mention her. Yeah, she she taught me a lot. Um, so I did used to look up to her quite a lot because she played in the position. My first season in the WSL, she literally talked me through every single game so I couldn't put a step wrong. Um, yeah. So she was a big part of my, my development. Um, but I think in terms of right here and right now I think it's like Steph Hort and Lucy Bronze um they're big players in the women's game that everyone looks up to really um, yeah I think they've made a good impact and and they inspire the next generation definitely you mentioned Lindy Johnson I, I I read up that she was one of your idols what's it like playing with your idol yeah um I think just because of how much she done for me I think it was a lot I'm a lot like, 
I look up to her a lot more. Um, I think probably going into the women's game, I'm, I'm not going to lie, I didn't really know who she was. I wasn't into women's football that much. Mm. Um, but then as soon as I stepped foot into the training ground, I, I, I never forget <laughs> meeting her because yeah. she has done a lot for me. Um, and my dad always goes like, you need someone like Lindsay Johnson next to you. <laughs> Do you think having that... Um relationship with Lindy as well as as well as the upbringing that you've had in football having that great support do you think that's built your character into being someone that's become if not one of the youngest captains for 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 a professional team because you became a vi joint vice captain right or joint captain yeah I was joint vice captain uh yeah I think character is something that you get through growing up um mm. and how you brought up I believe, I'm a big believer in that and yeah. my dad has always been quite harsh with me um, and I think that only makes me demand more from myself um, and yeah I think the way that you brought up is how your character will then become and show and I think I've always been a winner because I've been brought up that way and that's yeah. just how I like to play um, and then I think as you grow older then you start toning down and like improving in every respect I think as a leader I still have a lot to learn but yeah. I think I've learned a lot and I feel like I'm on the right path for it definitely and and it was with your, with your bestie really isn't it Georgia yeah <laughs> like the best what's the how does the other teammates feel when you when the two closest link up and they're captain and vice captain <laughs> is it like oh it's us against them or is it just like oh well well we wasn't the actual captain so we had the the captain I think it was Dan Turner yeah um, so she was she was like the forefront we was just supporting behind um and we was just good we was just big characters in the change room in terms of there for a laugh um made sure that we was always happy really I think yeah you can never take the enjoyment out of something that you do because otherwise you won't enjoy it anymore so it's just to make sure that you're still enjoying it at the same time as doing and working hard yeah talk to me about like the lead up into becoming, for your personal journey into becoming a professional player, because I've spoken to a lot of players in the women's game and normally a majority of their time whilst they were playing, they had to juggle, you know, either a part-time job or studying. What was the journey like for you? Because like a lot of players say, they didn't see a professional career at the end of it. They just play the game for the love of it. So what, what was you doing in the meantime before the professional contract came about? Well, I was in college, so I remember my first year. I think I had the FA Cup final on a Sunday and college on a Monday. Oh, my God. I think I might have skipped that day then, but... <laughs> I would have. I can't lie. The adrenaline would have been too much. Um, so, yeah, I was in college. I was studying uh, BTEC sport. Um, and then we... I, as I finished college, I started working for Everton in the community for a year so I used to train in the morning we used to mm -hmm. do a day session which was optional and then I'd go to the office for a few hours and then we'd have a session which was obviously the compulsory one in the evening and I was doing that for like a year and then yeah. after that we went professional so it was okay but it was tiring yeah. my days were literally like eight until 10 at night <laughs> 8 a.m till 10 p.m because we used to have to get in for the day session and then yeah. um I went into the office and then yeah we had our training sessions were quite late in the evening yeah. and obviously Liverpool to Manchester is a good 45 minutes so including all the journey yeah no a lot <laughs> while she was at college though did like your classmates low-key see you as like the, the class celeb because you're just there playing football FA Cups like come on uh, well my my PE teacher she used to play football um, and yeah. So she she loved it. So she used to help me with my work quite a lot because I used to miss a few days here and there. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of favouritism. Yeah. <laughs> Going back to Everton, though, I, I did mention at the beginning that you became the first full-time professional footballer for Everton. How how did that come about? Was it like, was there like a queue and you were just the first one there to sign? Or like, was you just the first professional footballer and that's just history in the making? Yeah. Um, they offered me a contract and when they offered it me they said they wanted me to be the first professional football player at the club which was obviously it was unbelievable for me obviously I've been at the club now for seven years there's a lot of people that are probably well a few that have been there um a bit longer than me but at the time I think I was I was doing really well and they wanted to give me something back for that um yeah. so 
yeah, they said that to me and I did become the first professional footballer ever. And what did that like what did that mean to you? Yeah, it meant a lot. Um it was I respected the club a lot for it, obviously. Um there's how many players there was like twenty, twenty three and for them to want me to be the first professional footballer at the club that has a lot of history. Um mm. was yeah, it was unbelievable. It's major. And a few um not long after that, Willie Kirk joined. How important has he been for everyone and what's your what's your relationship like with him? Yeah, I think. Um between Andy and Willie, they're completely different managers in their own ways. Um, I think when Willie came in, it was a breath of fresh air for the club. We wasn't doing too well. Mm. Um, we was in relegation battles and that for Everton isn't where they should be. Yeah. Um, so I think it was a breath of fresh air. And I think Willie's been great for the club. Um, he's took us from relegating to mid-table and then obviously we want to go further than that and everywhere is everything is just a stepping stone for that um he's helping me improve his support that he's given me during my ACL has been uh phenomenal for me so I think he's been great for the club that's amazing and you said like you know he's, he's rejuvenated the club I mean we saw it at the beginning of this season it was they had like a Everton had like a crazy unbeaten run and everyone was just a bit like, well, where's this come from? And at the same time, the counterparts, the men's team also had like a great start to the Premier League season. How did that feel as a, like as an Evertonian, as a player for the club? It must have been, I mean, you're not there because of the whole COVID restrictions and stuff, but around the whole club as a whole, it must have been like a really good atmosphere. Well, yeah, because at the time I was kind of like a fan because I was out <laughs> So I was like being a diehard Evertonian and I was buzzing so yeah. Um, yeah it was great for the club in terms of the men and the women doing well but um, I think we want to be doing even better than what we're doing now um, I think we're fifth and we need to be pushing top four and pushing for silverware at the end of it you don't play football not to win so I think yeah. that's the next step for us but like you said it can't happen overnight and it's a it's a planning process and hopefully we'll keep getting better year on year Definitely. I see it happening. I mean, every year, I mean, well, not regularly, but you normally see teams progress more and more and more. So you've pushed on to that, like I said, mid-table spot. And everyone, I'm pretty sure, was scared of Everton at the beginning of the season. Um, so there's, and it, I know it's tight now in the WSL. There's this team that normally sitting at the top, like the Man Cities and the and the Arsenals, that now Manchester United have come, come in out of nowhere after, you know, second professional season. So anything's possible in the WSL. It's becoming even more competitive. Like when you speak to fans of football who don't watch re women's football regularly, they would always just say Chelsea, Arsenal, because that's all they know. And then the big names are there as well. But it's become super competitive. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing the likes of United and Everton creep up there when um, people don't expect it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Let's talk international duties, though. Because you've uh, represented England for pretty much every stage, under 17, 18, 19, 20. The most, being on the big stage at the under 20 World Cup and a couple of European finals. Talk to me about those experiences, especially the World Cup. Yeah, um, I think I've been incredibly lucky to be part of England from under 17s all the way through to the seniors and get senior caps at a young age at a position that is not really seen as a young player's position mm. um, I think the World Cup was phenomenal um, I think I was 16 at the time and it was like wow um, so we went I think there was me and Leah Williamson um, went up from the under 17s um, and yeah it was a great experience for me um, I, I even got a few minutes out there I played the last game versus Nigeria um, so, yeah, that was great for me. And the manager was Mo Marley and I had her, she come to our own 17 Euros and I had it all the way through. And then she gave me my first uh, senior call up um, to one of the World Cup qualifiers. I came in off standby for Casey Stoney. Um, and, yeah, I think I've had a, a good international career at youth so far, but I want to push on in terms of um, the senior setup. I've, I've done a, quite a lot of camps, but I only have two caps and I want to push on for more and I want to go to England and win trophies with England. Um, so I've just got to keep working hard and hopefully get back to full fitness and do well at club and hopefully that can come to. Surely that must be inspiring though when you when you look at those times that you have travelled with the England squad to the games that you've mentioned as well and the camps that you've been in and you look around the squad that is around you, you mentioned Leah Williamson 
Um, and there was a lot of other players as well, like Lottie and Kira. And I, the, I can't even really afford the names, but a lot of these players are now regular starters in the WSL and have gone on to, to, do, to do big things. Is that not a big inspiration to you to see how much, how many of those players have like pushed through to the next level? Yeah, it is. It's ins inspirational. Um, I think at the time I broke through, there was only a few youngsters. There was like Kira, Leah, me. I think Jess Carter was on some camp. So yeah. there were only a few of us. But now the youth are getting better and now they're, they're coming through a lot sooner, I think, um, which is good for the women's game because the more experience they have now will be the better for them in the major tournament. So mm. I think it's good for the women's game and it's good that they're all performing week in, week out in the WSL with some of the best players in the world. Now on to the next level, you know, I mentioned like some of the youngsters pushing through from international duty to beyond, but then you had the call up for the She Belize Cup in 2018. Now in this cup, you're surrounded by a lot of the, the senior players What's that experience like? I know you know them well, you've played against them in the WSL, but being in that England camp with them, um, what's what's that experience like? The travelling, the you know, the new roommates and stuff in hotels, or I don't know if you had the same actually. Who was your roommate on She Blues? It was I think it was Nikita Paris. Oh and nice. I yeah. started with Siobhan Chamberlain and then um I got Keats after. Um, but I knew Keats from Everton already, so that was quite good for me. And she's a big character. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's not my big sister now, so yeah, that was good. Um, I think going to the She Believes was, I, I was really proud getting called up to that. Um, and I enjoyed it. I was in America with the best players in the world. The training mm. was very high intensity, and I enjoyed every moment of it. I was playing against some of the best forwards that that have played week day in day out um mm -hmm. and we got to see america as well a little bit so yeah. i was what i played we played usa and yeah it was it was a great experience for me and it only made me hungrier to want more and come back and improve speaking of like playing against america and being out in america uh, american and like the u.s women's national team have just been seen as the pinnacle of women's football but now we're seeing a lot of the americans come over to english football but at that time everyone pretty much sees them as the be all and end all. I don't know if I can't speak for everyone, but what was that experience like when you're seeing certain players in the flesh and you're having to go up against them? I mean, who was the forward at the time that she believes? I think it was like Carly Lloyd or Alex Morgan. Yeah. Uh, one of them, but it was a great experience for me to see it and be involved really. Um, you couldn't really ask for much more. I think I was 21 at the time. Imagine. Uh, so yeah, it was a great experience for me to see them. And now they're all coming over. So, yeah, I'm itching to get back out on the pitch and test myself against some of the best players in the world. Yeah. And what was it like being coached under Phil Neville for that tournament? Yeah, um, I think that was one of his first camps. So he come out to the manga and then she believes, um, obviously, he's a United and Everton legend. So it was good for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, yeah, his coaching was good and he was a he was a good person as well. It's great that he called you up, but, I mean... Looking forward for you now, when you want to progress into senior England squad, obviously he won't be the manager in charge then. Um, what's your what's your feelings for the next manager that comes in now, and and how how are you feeling about possibly getting in? It's gonna it's, it's a hard squad to get into at the moment. There's so much talent, and obviously, like you said, you've got to work hard to get back into regular football. But how excited are you to, to see the new manager and hopefully get in there for possibly the next tournament after? So, oh, maybe for the Euros. Yeah, well, I'm I'm just going to get back to club and try and perform my best, and hopefully I can catch the eye. But yeah, perform whilst it's club before country, and you have to make sure that you're doing it day in day out, weekend after weekend at your club before you can even think about international football. So mm -hmm. I'm just itching to get back to club and do that, and hopefully get get the recognition of the new manager. I think it's an exciting time for for England as a country um yeah. the manager coming in she's won trophies before so she knows what it takes to win and I think that's what England need and England deserve trophies because the players that they've got are phenomenal um mm -hmm. and I think that's the next step for England just to go and win World Cup win Euros and do it back to back definitely and that's what that's what we want to see to be honest with you now speaking of international duties and being on the big stage 2018 saw England almost bring it home. Now, I've got some really great guests alongside you coming on this podcast. Um, Enia Luko, 
Um, hopefully Lauren James not I'm trying to get her pinned down while she's um recovering. Um and when I was when I do my women's football show, um obviously there's a lot of I do on AFTV, there's a lot of fans of the Premier League. So they always say, Oh, um, there's so many relationship relationships from the WSL to the Premier League. So you had Eni and Sonny, and they're always bringing up Lauren and Reese. And then you, you've got a he's your older cousin, right? Yeah, of yeah. course, your cousin. Um, who's a very well-known Premier League player, Jesse Lingard. What is it like having him support you at the games? Because it's so great when you see Reese always, you know, big up his sister. It's always great to have that advocate of well-known men, sports players and athletes support the women's game. So when he's physically there at the games, like, what does that mean for you? Yeah, it's good because obviously he's got um, a busy schedule. So when he gets the time to come and watch me, it's it's good because he'll give me feedback and stuff um, and he understands what it takes to be a professional footballer. Um, he's worked really hard to get where he is. You don't just break through at Manchester United yeah. being average. So he, he's had a good career himself and he's still working hard. Um, I think the best thing for Jesse is he's he's an unbelievable person. Like his personality, his character, he always finds good in every situation. Um, yeah. And I think that's the best thing about Jesse. Um, he's one of the nicest people ever. Lich, I love that about him. Even though, like, as an Arsenal fan, he trolled me. I was literally at the game when he did the moonwalking and stuff. You cannot dislike this guy. Like, he's always had good vibes. And whenever I see him do content with you, I love seeing you two link up. I saw you do some FIFA Volta content, um, some other stuff for Adidas as well. And he just always seems like a beacon of positivity. And you, you two look like you have a great relationship. I've seen pictures of you both training at St. George's Park. That must have been amazing in itself. Like, you know, like when you're at school and you're, you've got a friend in another class, but then when you link up, it's like, oh, we're here. So like St. Yeah. George's Park must have been sick having like been able to be there at the same time. Well, yeah, he's a little, he's cheeky, isn't he? So I was like, I can't get in trouble when I'm in England camp. <laughs> but no, um, it was good to be there at the same time. We both had the same goals at the time, which was we both wanted to go to the World Cup. He went, I didn't, but I was still supporting from back home and I went out to Russia and supported him. Um, and he had a great World Cup, so I was buzzing for him. Um, and the girls did well. Yeah. And, World Cup so I, I was happy and I had a great summer. <laughs> it, it must have been the best summer because I, I was I mean everyone that knows me knows that I was heavily pregnant at the time and gave birth during when England were playing so I, I was meant to be at that World Cup but you had the luxury of not only going there but being able to support someone on that England England national team and it was one of the best summers for, for English football although they didn't go all the way they had a really great campaign. What was it like being out there and just seeing it firsthand being part of the atmosphere getting to see some of the players after the game as well yeah it was literally crazy like it was a surreal experience because it's not something that you get to do every day yeah. um, and we got um a private like they had like an fa for like friends and family like a yeah. general went over oh um, fancy yeah so we got to go on that um and then we got to see him after the game and we won so yeah we thought the world cup was coming on but <laughs> we all thought don't worry we all thought it <laughs> But yeah, it was a surreal experience. I loved it. Well, thank you so much. I mean, it's been a pleasure talking to you. We could talk more and more. I mean, there's so much more I want to know about you, to be honest with you. But it's great to see how you started, where you've come from. Coming back from the injury, I can't wait to see you get out there and hopefully get a full night soon. But I'm sure you'll be eased in slowly. Um, and what else you can achieve coming up for more international duties and, of course, for club as well. I mean, what what have you set any personal targets for yourself? I just want to get back out on the pitch and... Just make sure that I, I continue to enjoy the game. I think when you get to, when the game gets took away from you, you realise you. I took it for granted doing it every day. Um, yeah. I'll make sure when I go back, I don't take it for granted every day, and I leave everything on the pitch after every training session. Before I let you go, I just want to ask you some questions that are not related to football because, <laughs> you know, it's not everyday football. What's one song, yeah, that you've just got on repeat? I'm not a really repeat type person, but if you like to, like, repeat songs, what's one song you've got on repeat right now? Um, Drake, Laugh Now, Cry Later. Oh, yeah. You can't, you can't go wrong with Drake. You can't. No. Did you, did you watch the Super Bowl last night? I stayed up mad late. Yeah. Oh, so this is the first time I've ever <laughs> the first time I've ever watched a Super Bowl. Like, because it's locked down, like my whole routine's gone out the window. Yeah. I wake up mad late now, go to bed crazy hours of the morning. So I thought might as well watch the Super Bowl. Um the weekend, I just forgot how underrated he I've I've been underrating him. 
I was like, oh, the weekend's doing half time show. But then as every song came on, I was like, oh, this is a banger, mate. <laughs> <laughs> what's um what's one are you more of a um trainer or or heels person? Uh trainer. Yeah, 100. Um, what's your favorite crepes right now? Mm, or a classic, or a classic one that you just can't that has to be in your your staple pieces. If it's a classic one, it's got to be super style. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I love a good old Yeezys. Yeah, love a Yeezy. What's your favorite one? There's so many now. I can't keep up. Uh, the black and red ones. Ooh, nice classic. Yeah. All right, Gabs. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for for coming on. Like I said, I wish you the best for the rest of the season and your career. Hopefully, I get to. See, I haven't been to a game in ages. So hopefully, I get to see you. <laughs> huh? As I could imagine. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it's been so long. I'm even forgetting what it feels like to go to games. But hopefully, when we're back to normal, we can see you chop it up on the pitch, and it'll be great to see what you do out there. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's been a pleasure, honestly. Also, for anyone that's listening on Spotify, make sure that you subscribed for more great guests that are coming on the show. If you're on YouTube, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next one. Take care, guys. <laughs>